Hey, what's going on folks? It's Mike here and welcome back to my SDL3 programming series. In today's episode, we're going to be taking a look at our abstraction and adding a little bit more features to it. Things like computing the frame rate and again, just adding a little bit of organization that's going to help us throughout the rest of this series and ultimately for you to build your graphics and gaming applications with SDL. So with that said, let's go ahead and dive into it. And basically what I want to do today here is just a quick review here, and then we'll go ahead and start restructuring our program a little bit. So where we left off last time is we created this struct called SDL application, and we're able to, now that we have a struct, have a single instance of this SDL application, or you could have more if you want to test things or whatever the case is. Uh, but the important part is that I can hold the state here that's sort of, well, global or applicable to this SDL application. I have a defined place where I can construct things like my window, set up my SDL subsystems, and then I can destroy my application as follows. Now, the part where things get a little bit more interesting is where we have this tick uh, function here. Now, this is what I'm actually going to modify a little bit today here. And since we're doing just input stuff here, this is where I want to handle input. And then ultimately, we want to do some rendering stuff. So I'll want to have maybe a rendering function and maybe an update function where I update the game logic. So that'll be the basic idea of what we're going to update. So this main loop function will change a little bit, but it'll also be quite debuggable and that I can put breakpoints on these individual functions, which I talked about last time, which is nice. And again, as always, our entry point here is going to remain unchanged. Again, it's just nice, simple and clean. I can launch multiple instances of my app if I want to do some testing or something, uh, but that's the basic idea. OK, so let's go ahead and dive into just a little bit of refactoring here. Uh, I'll dive into the uh, documentation in a moment here because we're going to want to do some things like maybe compute the frame rate, for instance. But let's just start refactoring this a little bit. And the very first thing that I want to do here is kind of separate out this function here. And again, there's a few different ways that I can uh, abstract this. I could just have this uh, you know, input function here, uh, which is handling input stuff. Uh, and that's exactly all it's doing. And then I could have my update function and then a render function as follows here. And that's probably pretty reasonable. The, the thing that I, you might want to think about is if you want to put those three functions in another function called uh, tick here, which I'm actually going to do that here. So I'm going to keep our same main loop structure or pretty much the same thing here. Um, and let's just add some comments here. So input handle input. Uh, events from IO or networking devices. Again, I know that's pretty obvious from the name of the function, but ultimately that's what we want to do here. Where are we getting inputs from? User devices, okay? And that's going to be the first thing that I want to handle here uh, in my sort of tick function here, input. The order sort of does matter here. We do want to take things into consideration. Um, when you get into maybe more advanced rendering stuff, you will hear talks about things where sometimes you skip a frame to try to speed things up or maybe do something every other frame. You know, you don't have to worry about that right now. Uh, but anyways, we pretty much just want to do input, update, and render here, okay, in our tick function here. So we're going to handle all these different cases. Um, now, the other reason why I decided to separate these out to input, update, render, and then have this function called tick here uh, and then main loop, right? You could condense these down into three functions if you want. Um, but depending on what you want to do with your framework, um, there might be an instance where you might want to be able to change or make these like callback functions or have a function pointer into what the render function is actually doing. For instance, if it's calling into some other system or library. So again, it just gives you a little bit of flexibility on the game loop. Uh, for how you want to structure it. But again, this will this will kind of do the trick here. So uh, let me just fold this just so you can get a high level view again of what our uh, struct looks like here. And these are empty for now. Uh, but here is the uh, main loop, which calls the tick function, which will run input, update, and render here. OK, so hopefully that's clear of what's going on. And then our, our constructor and destructor is handling the initialization of each of these subsystems. OK, so let's go ahead and give this a compile here. Uh, just so we can see that it should do uh, basically the same thing here. Launching a window. Uh, the window has just got junk in it at this point because we're not rendering any pixels. So it's just whatever happens to be filled in memory there, which uh, is always capturing a little bit of my recording software, I guess, the UI. <laughs> but OK. So now let's go ahead and do a perhaps more interesting task here. Now that we've got our game loop sort of set up in a nice way here, 
uh, where again, we'll have a clear division of what's supposed to be going on. Uh, update will be things like the game logic. Render will be once we start drawing some shapes here, okay? Uh, all right, so anyways, um, let's maybe do something interesting by computing the frame rate here, okay? So we can see how many frames are going. And there's other interesting things like, for instance, doing... Uh, frame independent movement. I've done some videos on these uh, previously here, but let's just start with the basics of the, uh, based on the APIs here, I'll go to the API categories. And SDL has a bunch of timer functions here that we can use here. So for time management, things like uh, getting the, uh, well, there is stuff for calendar time management, uh, but this is things like adding delay, which I showed at the very start of this series. Well, or one of the early applications for our sort of like popping up a window and delaying. Um, but we also have this function here, get ticks. And if you want nanosecond type precision, you can also do that. Um, and there are also interesting timers here where you can create callback functions. So this is gonna be a cool thing. I mean, you could use this for your game play programming here where you wanna have a function called every five milliseconds or something. Uh, that might be fun to play around with a little bit later. But let's just look at this get ticks function, which basically uh, gets the number of milliseconds that have elapsed since SDL library initialized. And basically we're gonna do the classic like elapsed timer thing here. So what I'm gonna wanna do here is have a uh, start timer here. Uh, and I'm gonna use the SDL types here. So that's a uint64 here. Uh, and let's just call this current uh, tick here. I'll use the same uh, vocabulary as SDL. We will get the ticks here. And then I wanna count well, based off of how much time has passed, so let's say something like this, the elapsed uh, tick equals, well, what's the current time, which is always incrementing, right? So this function minus uh, where we first recorded the time here, okay? And that'll tell us how many uh, milliseconds here in the documentation have passed. Now, the common thing to do, and this is a good metric if you're just like profiling and you wanna kinda say, or see like, hey, is the time per frame growing? Or, you know, if we add some logic to our code, uh, if this, you know, elapsed uh, time or elapsed uh, number of ticks starts increasing more, that means, again, you might wanna optimize something. Uh, but how we usually think about things in games is the uh, frames per second. So frames per second. So how many uh, frames were we able to render uh, in a second is kind of an interesting uh, metric for us to have here. Uh, so let's scroll down. There is a little uh, code example here uh, that is doing, giving us sort of an example of how we might do something like this, right? Again, recording the current time like we did here. And then this is the interesting part of the code here. It says, okay, if the current time plus whatever the last time is that we recorded plus 1,000, so 1,000 milliseconds, then we should maybe report on something here. Okay, so let's go ahead and add uh, a little bit of stuff here. Let's just say we're gonna have something called frames. Um, and this would probably be a uint64 unsigned as well. Frames equals zero. And every time that this loop increments, I want to increment my frame counter. And basically what I'm gonna do here is say, if the elapsed uh, time, or rather, well, let's just do, We'll set it up the way that they have it here. So if the current time here uh, is greater than last time plus a thousand milliseconds, then we'll want to uh, update last time here. So let's get rid of that here. Th this is still useful, this block and this block. Again, if you just want to like count again how long it took here. Uh, so let me think about... Um, oh, well, let's, let's actually keep that just so we have all the timing functionality here. Because really what this is telling us is something kind of interesting. Uh, I'll just call it, let me give it a better name though, like the delta time um, between each frame here, okay? Uh, and you'll see this in other game engines um, where you know if it took a long time or just a little bit of time, we often use this sort of variable as something 
um, that we can kind of like multiply through various calculations for when you're like moving some objects. So if it took you one second, for instance, for a frame uh, versus taking two seconds, you might want to multiply by that delta time so an object can sort of catch up since for whatever reason, you know, it's, it, and that helps with the frame independent movement. So maybe we'll, we'll get into that later and, and probably move this uh, outside of the main loop here. But again, let's just count the frames per second here. So if the current uh, tick rate, and then we need to record our uh, last time here. So again, I'm going to do this as a UN64. Last time equals, uh, and I guess I just have to initialize it with some value here, zero. So, you know, it's probably going to catch that first frame here, but that's okay. Uh, the last time will equal the current time, uh, current tick here current time or a current uh, tick, however you want to think about it, since it's in time of milliseconds. And then what we're going to want to do here, reset our frame count to zero. So let's just actually call this FPS for frames per second. Uh, number of frames per second, just so that's clear. It doesn't stand for first person shooter or anything like that, just FPS. And let's actually report on it. So how do we do this? Well, let's see. I think it's SDL. Let's see if it's set window title or something. Let's go back to our category uh, API. Uh, let's go to this one here. Uh, we want to go to window. And I think it's something like get window title. And then there should be set window title. Set window title. So the window and the actual title set window. Let's see here. Yes. Set window title. This is just our M window, which is a member of this struct here. If we go to the top here, again, we have that. And uh, I will set it to, let's see, uh, I need to do the frames per second here. Uh, now I might need to, I wonder, I might have to include string here. Our first real dependency. Let's just do that here. Uh, and then go back here and let's go ahead and do d2 string FPS here. Um, and I wonder, I think I could just concatenate it with the plus here. Mike's SDL three and we'll put a colon here. Let's see how we did here as far as compilation mistakes. Uh, let's see here. Uh, why is this not happy? Oh, I see. Uh, Let's kind of just do this in two steps here. Uh, string title equals uh, something like title plus equal. Uh, let's do Mike's SDL three plus. Let's see if this works here. If I can add that here, and then this needs to be a C style string here. So I can just do title C string. Something like that here. Let's see if we get any more interesting error messages. Uh, oops, get rid of that semicolon. All right, that's a little bit better here. Let's run it. Okay, and then after a second elapsed here, you can see I have Mike's SDL three and then a zero. Uh oh, let's see if we made a mistake. Oh, I did make a mistake here. I zeroed out the frames per second before we reported on it. Let's see if that does the trick here. Okay, that's doing better here. Uh, and I should add a space here <laughs> just so we can see here. And let's add FPS and a space, something like that. Uh, and you're going to notice that it's running pretty fast here. Let's see, I'm doing 316,000 frames uh, per second, I guess, here. <laughs> that, that, that's pretty good here. Um, so let's see if we can get it to like a known value. Um, and I'll do this very quickly on a... Uh, just to show you the calculation here, right? If I want to calculate the frames per second, um, well, let's say if I have uh, something popular like 60 frames per second, that's how many I want here. So if I do 1,000 divided by 60, that should give me about, uh, let's see if I can bring out my calculator here. I usually have this memorized. This should be like 16 something. 1,000 divided by 60. 16.666 uh, milliseconds, 16.66 milliseconds, right? Uh, so that's what 60 frames per second is. And that's sort of your budget 
uh, to complete this game loop, okay? Uh, obviously, if you give yourself 30 frames per second, you get twice as much. If you give yourself 90 frames per second, like you might need in a virtual reality application or 120 frames per second, right? This is how much, you know, your, your budget is, right, accordingly. So uh, I'm going to do this simply, uh, let's discard that, by just putting in a SDL delay here in our loop here. Let's put it at the top here. So we'll do our work, which is nothing, basically. Uh, we'll delay then by 16 milliseconds, which is approximately 16.66. And we should see a number around 60 frames per second here. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, and I am seeing, yeah, 61, 62 frames per second. If I do something you know, more or less, we'll see a change here. Okay, so we've successfully um, done uh, our frames per second calculation. We've organized our loop here, uh, which is a little bit nice here uh, with some of that timing. And as a little challenge, if you want, you could actually abstract this into some sort of like FPS counter or something. You could put this in some sort of struct here. And maybe one of the challenges that we'll do later, uh, sometimes I give this as a homework assignment, is to say, how do we you know, make this stable, right? We don't want to delay 16 milliseconds all the time um, because, well, what if we actually, what if it took us 10 milliseconds to actually do our frame? Then we only want to delay maybe six uh, frames per second, or, or excuse me, six milliseconds here. So that's a little uh, challenge you can do for yourself to make this sort of stable. There are some other things we'll look at maybe later in this series, or if you've seen my SDL2 series, in which I already covered the SDL3 part of using like a V-Sync that will sync your frames per second to whatever the monitor's refresh rate is. But anyways, this gives us a good idea uh, of what's going on here. Um, now, in fact, just for structural uh, things here, uh, let's just say here is our infinite loop here, just to give a little bit of comment here. They could clean this up a little bit, but overall I'm pretty happy with this. Uh, and this is going to be our FPS calculation. And this is going to be our per frame calculation of elapsed time. And again, if you're doing some profiling or something, maybe you'd want to put like a breakpoint here. Um, and, and at the start of the loop here, just so you could see as you advance, how much time did it actually take uh, before the tick and then uh, to actually compute the delta time. So again, there's a few interesting uh, things going on here in this lesson, but hopefully you learned a few things. And again, we've cleaned up our uh, application here. So now that we can actually start writing uh, some rendering code or some game logic as we, as we move forward through this series. All right, folks, with that said, I'll go ahead and wrap it up there. As always, you can follow along these lessons. Let me scroll to the SDL3 here on course.mshow.io or on YouTube. And again, thanks for your time and attention. I'll look forward to seeing you in the next one.